the machine learning to extract information from Japanese American World War II records. Um, this team is composed of uh, Marisa Friedman, Marie Ellings, um, Vinge, uh, Vinge, think, sorry, Tracy Tan and Cameron Ford. I think Mari is, uh, will start the presentation. Yes, yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah, actually, this is a, a, a interesting follow up to the last talk, which I thought was fascinating. Um, this is kind of a project in the wild. So um, we're going to be talking about how we're using AI and machine learning to extract data from Japanese American confinement records that are held in the Bancroft Library. So this project has been funded in part by a grant from the National Park Service, uh, the Japanese American Confinement Sites Program, and it's run through the Bancroft Library. Uh, my name is Mary Ailings. I am the interim director, at, deputy director, excuse me, at the Bancroft and the, the PI on this project. Um, I'm joined with, by Marissa Friedman, who is the um, project manager working in Bancroft, and Cameron Ford, who is the co-founder of Doxy AI, which is a startup formed by former UC Berkeley I School students um, in data science. And he'll talk about the AI machine side of this. So. Um, this project was conceived in 2017 to 2018. We got interrupted by the pandemic. Um, <laughs> and it's somewhat different from our previous JAX projects. It is, um, which were just basically digitizing and publishing um, archival records. And in this one, we wanted to explore how we would improve computational usability of the records by facilitating um, uh, and, and looking into efficient and cost-effective data extraction to support and encourage computational research. So the goals of our project uh, were first uh, to create a preservation quality um, images to preserve um, these, these documents over the long term. Second was to create a data set of the information held in these records um, to build a more accurate and more complete data set of Japanese American incarcerees during World War II, which improves upon the errors and gaps in the existing data file, which Marissa will talk a little bit about the history of that. It was created in 1966, I think. So we are um, also working to engage with community stakeholders and representatives to guide our ethical and responsible access planning. So we're looking at co-curation models, bringing community members together to talk about the sensitive data held in these records and how we'll provide access. Um, and finally, you know, our hope is to implement new tools and methods to expand computational access to our digital special collections um, in line with the you know, collections as data workflows that encourage computational use of digital and born digital collections and supports ethical access. So um, this project is exciting both on, on, technical on the technical side and the ethical side um, that we're exploring using machine learning it has been um, really exciting. And uh, we're looking to improve the way that we can extract data from those records as we digitize them. So uh, we're also working with individuals impacted by or represented um, um, in the records that we're extracting data from. Uh, so we're exploring this summer with a community advisor group meeting uh, where we'll bring together community members to determine um, some ethical access models we'll hope to use in the future. So that's a quick introduction. I'm gonna turn the mic over to Marissa and then Cameron uh, and they'll discuss uh, the work we've done so far. Um, so just a little bit about the records themselves. Um, between 1942 and 1943, the War Relocation Authority uh, used a census type two page form known as Form WRA 26 to collect uh, detailed demographic, educational, occupational, um, biographical, and even some health data um, about every Japanese American confined in one of the 10 separate WRA, WRA incarceration camps. Oops. Sorry. Um, the Bancroft is believed to hold the uh, only remaining uh, complete set of these forms, so totaling over 110,000, um, organized by camp in existence. Uh, as demonstrated on the timeline, data from these records has undergone a number of transformations and migrations over the years. Um, first, some of the data was coded to punch cards by the WRA in the 1940s, then migrated to magnetic tape at the Bancroft Library in the 60s, as Mary mentioned. The National Archives acquired a copy of this data file in the 90s and published it in 2003 as the Japanese American Internee Data File, which is the authoritative information resource for survivors, their families, and uh, researchers. 
Um, however, there are a lot of, um, there are some glaring limitations um, to the current NARA data file, which we're hoping to address uh, with the project. Uh, besides containing basic errors, uh, such as misspellings and um, things like that, a significant amount of information found in the original records is missing um, from the NARA data file. Things related to activities, skills, hobbies, a detailed educational and employment history, including things such as employer names and locations and wages and things like that, um, as well as geographic locations and addresses. Um, so one example you can see on the slide, uh, in comparing an individual's educational history from uh, their individual record, which is the top image, um, to what appears in the NARA data file, the bottom image, um, it's clear that specific details about educational institutions and dates attended are absent um, in the current database. And the educational history has been coded to represent only the highest grade level completed. Um, so we hope that by digitizing the entire collection, um, which totals over 220,000 pages of these records, um, we saw a unique opportunity to use machine learning here to recover more of this original data at scale um, and produce a richer, more accurate, and granular data set, um, while also hopefully reducing the cost in terms of uh, staff time and labor for undertaking mass transcription at this, at this scale. Um, because the original documents are primarily typewritten and contain structured data, uh, they were identified as suitable for experimenting uh, with machine learning. And while this assumption has mostly held, we have also discovered that the documents present a number of challenges, um, and not insignificant number of them have entirely handwritten responses. Um, and there are discrepancies in data types, content, and spacing of text on the page. Um, in fact, we've actually identified at least six or seven versions of the form that are in use um, through this process, which has produced a few complications. Um, and many documents also contain stamps, handwritten corrections, strike throughs, notes, and other marginalia that can produce a lot of visual noise for an OCR model to handle. So this has prompted continuous iteration um, and collaboration between DOCSI and library staff to better integrate these discoveries um, about the records into the ongoing development of DOCSI's customized pipeline. Um, and now I'll hand it off to Cameron to talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, Marissa. Yes, yeah, so hello, everyone. So as a uh, founding member of doxy.ai, we entered this space. And Marissa, if you could go to that next slide, that'd be perfect. So um, what we entered this space believing is that, you know, this is the center picture here is one of the founding principles of uh, data science within, and sorry, Marissa, I think maybe I have a lag. So if you could go back to that slide with the data science Venn diagram, perfect. So the center part of this with data science you know, we can bring machine learning knowledge or artificial intelligence knowledge by combining stats and coding. But to really be able to responsibly handle the data, we needed to partner closely with domain experts, such as um, our great partners at Bancroft, uh, to be able to really bring data science to bear in the best manner possible. Um, doing this really um, brings, you, you need to be able to bring that knowledge of what is the data that the um, the models have been trained on to be able to understand what biases that that um, information will bring downstream and to be able to mitigate those biases. And um, this process of understanding what is going into our pipeline as well as what is coming out and how do we develop this customized approach to extracting data. Um, this is really this iterative approach has developed a, a robust pipeline where we have a lot of unique aspects captured here. Um, and so some of the things that I would name with our partnership is that we're really focused on being able to um, properly handle the data, whether that there's sensitive data within there, um, handling unique data fields, so fields that don't follow um, maybe standard handwriting approaches, um, and we've, um, as well as delivering really high accuracy on all the different fields without a high amount of noise. Um, and so we'll get further into this as we go through there. Um, and so yeah, let's jump into for this audience, I want to talk about our, our pipeline a bit more. So when you take one of these individual forms that we've, um, and you want to extract data from it, this is a pipeline that we had rough, you know, this is a rough outline of our pipeline that we utilize. Um, so to start with, we um, bring in the 
as we ingest the form, we're going to start with an object detection to determine what type of form it is. We found during this iterative development that some of these camps actually have, even though to the human eye, you may not be able to see the differences um, not, you know, really easily, there's you know, three, four different types of forms that they iterated between, and maybe they capture data slightly differently. And so as we've customized for each one of those forms, we start with an object detection model that will identify which form are we processing here. Um, the next um, spot down the, uh, the pipeline is the pre-processing. We do a variety of different things here at the pre-processing, such as um, identifying the piece of information that we want to extract. So, okay, let's extract the name field, let's extract the um, location field, the camp information, the age, et cetera. Each of those fields we um, isolate on the form to look at uniquely. Um, and then we perform binarization at that localized level. Um, one of the things that we uh, learned early on was that if you binarize the entire form, the fading is actually quite, um, with historical documents, the fading can be inconsistent throughout the form. And so binarizing each field at that very localized area actually increased the values of our results um, quite significantly. So that was one of the many pre-processing steps that we utilized that I wanted to name here. Um, after that, when we're ready for the data extraction, we bring a variety of, um, depending on what the data is, we can bring a, a variety of different models to bear. Um, so the basis would be, of course, OCR. We're looking at um, hopefully typewritten text that we want to remove from there so we, we can bring a customized um, OCR model to that. We have a variety of those. Some are deep learning, some are machine learning. Um, there's also a handwriting model where, um, as Marissa mentioned, we came across many uh, different forms that are handwritten. And then object detection, which we'll, we'll show you an example of later, but for our checkboxes. Um, after that process, we go through some logical um, checks, which we use some natural language processing for, to determine, is this the expected type of data that we're looking for? Are there any corrections we can make? Or do we need to flag this for review for the Bancroft team as they go back and review this data with the um, community? Do we need to flag some of these for review for them to um, identify? So let's look at the age field versus um, the date of birth field. And do those logically make sense or do we need to identify this? So some of this is pure logical, um, right? Uh, that we've written into the pipeline and other parts are based off of machine learning models. And finally, we do a, um, a QC step where we um, annotate uh, data that the models have not seen before to verify that the results are in fact um, returning what we would expect them at a quality that we would expect them to. And then we compile those results and, and share those CSVs with Bancroft. Um, and so that final process is, um, to step over that, there's, there's a lot of, uh, we, we do still have that manual hands-on touch with the data to make sure that we're receiving the information. And during that process is where we've uncovered, you know, identifying, wait, this is returning much worse than we expected. Okay, we're seeing different types of forms. We need to reconsider our, you know, what parts of the pipeline we need to develop here. Um, and so as we go through the different um, domains of the documents, we, we have developed a lot of different aspects here. So if you go to the next slide, um, I wanted to um, show a few examples of the types of processing that we're, we're doing. So this is an example of some of the post-processing where we would um, look at like, you know, the results of, the no of our machine learning model may contain noise that you would expect out of, you know, that sort of, as you look at this, your brain would read it properly. And then um, when you see how the machine reads it, you look back and you go, oh, that actually kind of makes sense why it's one dash one in the middle of this document here. I can see how that was computed in that manner. Um, but we're able to bring some natural language processing models to bear to use some error correction there. Um, and this is an area that we, we want to continue developing on over time, but um, it's been very helpful as um, to date. And then if you go to the next one, um, I love this example because it shows the, um, what the value of iterative development can be here. So um, there are, there, there's data on these forms that are checkboxes. Our initial read on how to do this um, in the best manner possible was to um, identify the boxes and then see how shaded in are they. And if they're heavily shaded in, let's count that as a check and then record the data appropriately. Over time, as we were looking and trying to improve the quality of the results, 
um, BJ, one of our founders, looked at this and said, you know, maybe we're approaching this the wrong direction uh, because we're getting some false positives from the way that maybe there's a smudge on the paper, et cetera. Let's instead uh, train a deep learning model to identify where the X's are. And then once it identifies an X, let's measure the distance from each of the other boxes, whichever box is closest to, we will count that as, a, as the correct one. And so the Japanese example here you can see was one that we would have missed previously, but immediately upon taking this new approach, we um, found a, a large uplift in, our, in the quality of results here. And so um, all, of these all of these different models, we, um, of course, the, the end result that we're seeking for is high quality outputs. And so from our mind, we, we think of this as we're returning structured data ready for research. Um, and if you, and uh, Marissa, if you go to that next slide there, then, um, but the, uh, we know that there's still work to be done to talk with the community and to analyze this data and say, okay, what, what does it mean for this ready to be, um, to be ready for research? Um, what we're really proud of here is that 90% of the fields we receive above the expected results of 85% accuracy. And, and some of them are much higher than that level of accuracy, which moves the, the Bancroft team uh, much further forward with much less hands-on work to get this data out to the, the communities affected, um, which we're, that's the piece that we're most excited about. Um, and then I also mentioned here that we do expect there to be humans in the loop um, after this to review the data. And so we have included some custom flags to identify where we know that some um, review is needed. And so uh, this can show the Bancroft team where to go back to in the data. And I believe I'm handing it back over to uh, Marissa or Mary. Oh, Mary, yeah, okay. just sorry, quickly, quickly wrap up. Um, so far, I think a lot of our success has been built on leveraging our partnerships, both on the technical side, but also on the community side. You know, we're learning as we go through this project and, um, and iterating as we go. So I think it's, it's been building knowledge as we go along. Um, it's making us uh, think really thoughtfully about the considerations of cost and scalability for our other collections. Like, you know, what are the right kinds of collections? Uh, you know, what we thought was a uniform collection turned out not to be and changed, you know, how we went about this project. So that's a big consideration going forward. Um, and then what does research ready data look like? You know, when, when is it good enough? And when have we not over processed? And that's another uh, thing we're trying to get out of this project. Um, so that's it. I will, we'll stop there and um, thank you. We will take questions, I think at, at the very end, but yeah, uh, yeah. Thank, you so thank, much. You. thank you so much, Marissa, Marie and, and Cameron. Thank you.